Yeah, um, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the event tonight. My name is Nozi Zwedube, and I am the coordinator of Undivided for K11, um, one of the co-organizers of this event, alongside Lean and Leuven Law. I'm also a master's student um, in law at the K11 itself. So why did we organize this event? Primarily because institutions of higher education all over the world seem to be grappling with achieving gender equity, in our opinion. So every higher education institution acknowledges in some way, shape or form, the necessity of gender equality through the enacting of gender policy, some more effective in it than others. On the 3rd of February this year, K11 conferred honorary doctorates to five women. During the conferral ceremony, the rector of KU Leuven, Luke Sells, mentioned that three out of 10 senior academic staff in 2019 at KU Leuven were women. Similar results, I believe, can be seen in other institutions across Flanders and Belgium at large. Although this was a considerable achievement in comparison with the few years prior, it is very clear that it is nowhere near enough. Where is the current gender policy lacking in exactly? which forms of, of affirmative action should be enacted, and what does the legal framework actually allow? So many questions that will be explored tonight. So indeed, the statistics I mentioned earlier point towards the existence of structural and institutional discrimination towards women. If higher education institutions were inclusive, we would simply not be here tonight. So the percentage of female students differs from faculty to faculty, but the systemic underrepresentation of female professors is a constant one. The higher up we go, the academic echelons, the leakier the pipeline gets, with more and more women being excluded in an institutional manner. One of the five honorary doctorates that I mentioned earlier was Professor Kimberly Crenshaw, the American lawyer and civil rights activist who coined the term intersectionality. This theory suggests that different forms of discrimination, such as sexism, racism, ableism, classism, and so forth, can overlap and compound each other. When we look at the faces of the women who do make up the professor body in K11 and other Belgian academic institutions today, we mostly see white women, primarily from middle class or upper class backgrounds. But where are the black and brown women? Women from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, women with visible and non-visible impairments where is the intersectionality within the gender policy itself? Indeed, where sexism is present, it usually comes hand in hand with other forms of exclusion, such as classism, homophobia, racism, ableism, and so forth. So while some, while some women fight to shatter one glass ceiling, you can argue that some women have two or more glass ceilings to shatter. While the debate tonight may focus on affirmative action regarding female senior academic staff and other higher echelons within academia, the same forms of institutional discrimination exist among and against certain students too. The makeup of the current professor body today is a result of the years long exclusion of different groups of society from the minute they enter education institutions. The institutional form of the exclusion is portrayed in how children from ethnic cultural minorities and working class children in Flanders are discriminated during their enrollment to kindergarten, as Ms. Dunia Bourabin, one of our panelists, showed in her research from a few months ago. The institutional form of discrimination within higher education is visible when minority students are victims of discrimination from fellow students sometimes, with academic institutions failing to curb the normalization of sexism, racism, classism, and other forms of exclusion within its midst in an effective manner. So today's event will delve into this and so much more. A practical announcement to all of the attendees tonight. It is possible to ask questions to all of the speakers, so also including the introductory lecture um, that will be given in just a few seconds. Um, you can do so by typing your question into the chat, in the chat box, and you have to send it specifically to Marie, so not just to everybody, but specifically to Marie. She will be collecting all of the questions, and these will be asked at the end of the panel discussion, which is the very last part of today's event. But you don't have to ask ask a question like only towards the end. If you have a question that comes up directly in you and someone else is speaking, you just type it in. You don't have to wait to type your question in only towards the, event, the end of the event. So just make sure you, you direct it directly to Marie. She will be collecting all of the questions, we'll collect them and then they will be asked at the end. But I would also just like to take a couple of more seconds to um, thank 
everybody for registering for the event. Also a very big thank you to Lean In Leuven Law for all the work behind the scenes uh, as co-organizers of this event. And of course, a last a very big thank you to all of the speakers and the moderator for um, sparing some time out of their obviously very busy agendas to take some time to discuss this very interesting topic. So I'm going to give the word now to Professor Vreeling for his introductory lecture regarding the legal context of affirmative action. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Um, thank you for the introduction. Thank you for organizing this, uh, both to uh, Lev and Lenin uh, and the other uh, co-organizers. As you see, I have a um, um, I have a uh, PowerPoint uh, presentation, um, and we can start with uh, the first slide. Uh, well, the subsequent slide after this one does. Or am I able to control it myself? No, okay, yeah. Okay, so um, I was asked to provide you with some uh, general background to the discussion, legal background uh, in particular, pertaining to uh, positive action, uh, particularly in the context of, uh, of academia. And in doing so, I'll start with uh, true to, to, to preliminary, to introductory issues. Uh, firstly, obviously, what is positive action? What are we talking about? Is there uh, a definition that we can use that's commonly accepted or is there uh, a debate? Um, and secondly, uh, given that, well, potential definition, what types of measures can positive action include? What, what's the range? What types of um, things can it include? We all know it can include quota, but is there anything else um, that can be uh, can be uh, installed. Um, and subsequently, and, and for the largest part of my presentation, we'll turn to the uh, legalities. And there I'll uh, mostly focus on European Union law um, and case law by the European Court of, uh, of Justice, um, since for our purposes, that's the most important framework, most important legal framework that governs um, these types of uh, measures. And uh, by way of uh, a spoiler already, I, I can tell you that that case law, the case law by the European Court of Justice, is um, is pretty strict. Um, it leaves some openings, as we'll see, but we'll see that the there is limited space for at least far-reaching forms of uh, positive action. But we'll start, like I said at the beginning. We can turn to the next slide. Uh, what is positive action? If we ask ourselves that question first, well, you'll uh, obviously, when you delve into the literature, you'll see that there's all kinds of definitions. Uh, every, every author uh, has his own uh, definition, but one of the definition that's relatively widely used uh, is a definition by uh, Bell, Hirty and uh, Livingston, who use positive action to refer to, and you can read along on the slide, um, all policies and measures that seek by means of positive steps to alter existing social practices so as to eliminate patterns of group exclusion and disadvantage in areas such as employment, education, and uh, business. So in other words, in their conception, positive action policies, positive action measures, are those policies and those measures in which an institution, uh, an organization, actively tries, actively seeks to reduce disadvantage on the basis of, of membership of a certain designated group. It can be on the basis of race, on the basis of gender, on the basis of uh, sexual orientation, religion, etc. Um, and such for the purpose of increasing the proportion of members of that group in context in which they are underrepresented uh, and underrepresented obviously mostly as a result of past or present discrimination, exclusion, uh, etc. Now positive action as has been a controversial uh, issue for, for decades already and uh, both on the societal level and on the political level it strongly divides opponents and proponents, uh, both of whom claim to defend a truly equal uh, society. They just differ in their conceptions of how to go about uh, achieving it. And much of the reasons for people to either be in favor of or opposed to positive action uh, has to do with the specific concept of equality that people are more, most partial to politically and ideologically. And I, I won't be boring you with too much theory uh, this evening, but we can discern 
two major models of equality. Most of uh, you will be familiar with this uh, and, and then the legal protection of those forms of equality. On, on the one hand, there is the, uh, the formal approach to equality, the, the symmetrical uh, approach to uh, equality. And that model focuses on uh, equality for individuals. Uh, formal neutrality is central to it. Uh, individual justice and the merit principle. Uh, people get what they deserve based on uh, their investments, their efforts, etc. The merit principle is, is a founding idea of that formal uh, approach of equality. On the other hand, uh, there is the substantive uh, approach to equality or the asymmetrical approach, the, the group justice uh, approach, as it's sometimes called as well. And mm -hmm. In that model, in, in varying degrees, uh, the focus is much more strongly on group characteristics, group belonging, and group impacts, and also desired outcome. Um, and within that concept of substantive equality, the concepts um, equality of outcome versus uh, equality of opportunities can still be uh, distinguished. So uh, positive action, in any case, is associated with substantive equality, so not with uh, formal equality, uh, but substantive equality that is either results-based or that focuses on equality of uh, opportunity. So positive action measures are either aimed at uh, eliminating discriminatory barriers to equality of opportunity, or they might even be aimed in certain cases at redressing unequal outcomes. Uh, so, so they try to guarantee equal uh, outcomes. And which of these is the more accurate uh, characterization, more accurate description? depends on the specific measure that is concerned, which immediately brings us to our next point, namely the question, what types of measures are included in that term uh, positive action? I think we can go to the next slide. Oh yeah, we skipped the slide. That's the, uh, the disadvantage of not. Okay, so the term positive action can describe a, a, a given that wide definition that I gave previously, can also describe a wide variety of policies, uh, a wide variety of uh, initiatives. And the nature of, of positive action measures vary from, from country to country. And within countries, uh, measures often also vary depending on the group that's concerned, uh, generally depending on the specific history of a country or a region. Uh, therefore, in Ireland, for instance, you'll see many measures pertaining to religion, whereas in much of the rest of Europe, that's much less common. Uh, so it very much uh, is, is a contextual, a contingent uh, feature and phenomenon. And that, that wide variety of, of possible measures is actually not well reflected in that single denomination of positive action, which somehow seems to suggest that it's a single kind of thing. Um, and what you also see quite often is that there's a tendency of people, uh, especially opponents, to uh, reduce positive action to the most controversial measures that are most in tension with the formal uh, equality uh, principle. However, what, we'll, uh, what, what I'll try to show you in, in, in my overview is that a lot of positive action is, is much more subtle and doesn't necessarily come into conflict with the guarantee of formal uh, equality and non-discrimination uh, at all. So what are the main types of positive action measures? I'll, I'll discuss four categories of, of measures that can all be regarded as amounting to uh, positive action, at least in the definition that I gave uh, to begin with. I can, uh, we can switch to the following slide to see the first two. Um, a first type of measure, a positive action measure, is sometimes labeled positive fairness. So positive fairness. Uh, Positive fairness involves that organizations, institutions um, actively and carefully try to examine, um, identify and, and also eradicate any indirectly or unconsciously discriminatory or distort distorting uh, practices and that they take active steps to try to put an end to such uh, practices. So in practical terms, what can you think about? Well, it will involve the use of, of regular reviews of how an organization selects its employees, um, how it conducts its job promotion, how it's uh, doing its business. Um, and the aim of, of that type of measure, of these positive fairness uh, measures, is to put a stop to any subtle, any unconscious discrimination that's taking place or that might take place uh, in the future. So if you can, well, if, if we're thinking about concrete examples, 
In employment, uh, it could entail avoiding recruitment by means of so-called uh, old boys networks uh, or word of, how, uh, word of mouth uh, hiring or other forms of non-transparent and, and highly discretionary uh, decision making. Or it could involve using anonymous CVs uh, to try to avoid, again, unconscious recruitment uh, discrimination. So here, uh, basically, the whole idea is to try to protect yourself as an institution against any indirectly and, and, and unconsciously biasing uh, decisions and decision-making procedures in your uh, organization. So that's the first uh, possibility. Um, another cluster of positive uh, action measures is often referred to as purposefully inclusive policies, uh, quite a mouthful, so purposefully inclusive policies, and that implies, uh, again, using neutral policies that seek to indirectly increase, increase the proportion of members of an underrepresented group by using criteria that themselves do not discriminate. Um, so again, that might sound a bit vague, but you can think of, for instance, uh, businesses that offer childcare services. Yeah, or that allow explicitly for the possibility for anyone to switch to part-time working. Uh, both of those policies are neutral in character. You can make use uh, of childcare services or you can switch to uh, part-time workers regardless of whether you're a, a man or uh, a woman. Uh, but they do indirectly benefit uh, disadvantaged groups. Why? Because policies concerning childcare and part-time work tend to be especially useful for uh, women, given the role, role uh, patterns that we have in our uh, society. Uh, in academia, for instance, it, it can also include, uh, because we're focusing especially on that, in acad academia, it can include taking into account the uh, effective period uh, during which someone was active as an academic uh, in assessing whether someone has sufficient output to be promoted or to be uh, higher. This again would indirectly benefit women or people with disabilities as well, uh, since they would not be sanctioned for going, in the case of women, on maternity leave, uh, during which they would be unable to uh, publish. Um, so the second category is, is actually also intended to avoid any later claims of indirect discrimination, right? because the link there is very close. Uh, because of course, if you do not take these sorts of things into account uh, actively yourself, it might lead to a claim of indirect discrimination. Uh, if you do not take that maternity leave into account, uh, a woman in a procedure might say, well, that's unfair because it indirectly discriminates. So that by actively, positively yourself already uh, preventing these sorts of things, uh, you try to, to avoid these, uh, these later claims uh, as well. Uh, if you take a skeptical view. Um, third, um, third category of measures, so we can switch, yeah, thank you. Uh, third uh, category of measures is uh, already slightly less neutral. So the first two categories didn't really use explicitly uh, team member or group membership um, um, uh, in itself in the measure. It just uh, involved, uh, well, critical scrutiny of what, uh, what you were doing. That third option uh, is already slightly less uh, neutral and it involves the use of uh, outreach programs, outreach programs that do use group membership or group affiliation and that try to accelerate the inclusion of uh, underrepresented groups, either through targeted support or through targeted uh, sensitization. And those types of measures are often called uh, positive mobilization. Um, and here you can think of things like, like targeted uh, information, uh, specific trainings, uh, education for the underrepresented uh, group. So a typical example is to offer mentorship programs to uh, women or to certain uh, minorities or to use uh, targeted encouragement in advertising for job uh, applications as well. So uh, concerning uh, that last point, uh, targeted um, encouragement, you can think of uh, the, the ads, the examples that I gave uh, on the slide uh, where it concerns sex and gender, so something like this company recognizing that it has no female electricians will welcome applications from women for this uh, post. Or the other way around, at present none of our secretarial staff are men, therefore applications from men as well as women are uh, welcome. So again, in the, in the actual selection, you do not take gender or minority status into account as such, but you do try to mobilize, you try to activate, you try to, to encourage candidates from minority groups to uh, apply, to overcome any barriers that might exist on that uh, level. 
Other forms of such mobilization or outreach can involve um, the, the setting aside, uh, the reservation of, of places at particular stages of the uh, recruitment uh, process. So for instance, by ensuring that one or more women are always interviewed for every vacancy, if there's a professorship, or that there's a, a shortlist uh, concerning which, if it's a shortlist of fifth, five people, uh, that ensures that at least two people are of a different, uh, different gender. Um, and if no such candidates apply, that you ought to keep actively looking for them until you find them and convince them to uh, participate. Um, so that's it for the third category that brings us to the fourth and, and final general category of, um, of positive action and that concerns actual uh, preferential treatment. So preferential treatment, so simply put, the, the favoring of members of the underrepresented group over members of the uh, dominating, of the dominant uh, group. And within that option, again, there is several sub options or, or degrees in which this is uh, possible. Uh, I'll, I'll discuss just four basic ones, but there's much more complicated subdivisions uh, that are possible in uh, reality. But let's look at the, 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 the basic subdivision. The first uh, and, and, and most common uh, option perhaps as well entails a weak preference. So a weak preference, what's a weak preference? Well, a weak preference would allow um, group membership, so concerning sex, race, or any other ground, to be one of various criteria of selection, so including experience, including diplomas, including uh, other relevant factors, um, each of which, each of these factors being more or less equal in uh, weight. So in that situation, any, any group-based preferences can be easily overridden by, by other reasons and other uh, considerations, hence the term weak uh, preference. A second category, also quite common, um, is that of a so-called tiebreaker preference. So the tiebreaker preference would grant a, an advantage to members of the underrepresented group uh, in case in which they are equally qualified for a certain position or equally deserving of a uh, particular uh, benefit. Um, and that refers to, uh, well, a common formula that you must have seen in, in job vacancies, uh, where uh, people say that in case of equal qualifications, uh, the, uh, the preference will go to, well, a member of a certain underrepresented group, be it women, be it people of a certain race, be it people of uh, a certain religion, etc. <clears throat> A third possibility, stronger still, is so-called minimal fitness. So minimal fitness, uh, minimal fitness entails a strong preference uh, for members of the underrepresented group, and the only requirement there is that they satisfy some minimal eligibility criteria for a certain position. Uh, but for instance, having a certain diploma or having at least ten publications, if it concerns uh, a professorship. But as soon as the underrepresented, uh, if the member of the underrepresented group uh, reaches that minimal threshold, uh, that person is uh, gets the benefit uh, and not the potentially higher qualified uh, other individual. And finally, uh, most strongly, there's the option of an absolute preference. So in that case, certain benefits, certain jobs, etc., are exclusively reserved for members of uh, the underrepresented group. So for instance, the underrepresented uh, sex. So, so that's it for a basic overview of, of types of measures. Uh, like I said, those categories that I just mentioned shouldn't be seen as formal shouldn't be seen as exhaustive. There's a, a lot of different categorizations possible. Uh, but what you should especially take note of, I think, and remember is, is the wide diversity of, of positive action processes and uh, measures. Okay, so that's it for a very brief, uh, brief background. I'll now try to introduce you to the permissible limits of positive action under the European Union uh, system of discrimination law. Okay, so under EU law, positive action is generally, and that's something to, to, to keep in, uh, in mind, is generally seen as an exception, as an exception to the general principle of uh, equality. So EU law tends to take a relatively formal uh, vision of, uh, of equality, uh, and therefore any exceptions to that formal principle need to be carefully justified in accordance with principles of uh, proportionality. So in principle, any form of direct discrimination 
based on sex or other grounds, uh, there are six grounds that are protected in the EU system, um, is prohibited in the context of employment. Um, and direct discrimination occurs when a person is treated less favorably on the basis of his or her sex than someone else in a comparable situation. Um, so if you have uh, certain types of positive action measures that can yield attention uh, in, this, uh, in this regard. At the same time, what you see is that positive action is a permissible justification for direct discrimination um, under European Union law, and that positive action has been a part of EU discrimination equality law uh, since the very uh, beginning. So uh, the very first, uh, very first regulations from the 1970s onwards dealing with the issue of sex discrimination in employment already provided for provisions that explicitly allowed for positive action. And all later regulations, including those concerning race, disability, age, religion, and, um, and sexual orientation, uh, they do the same, they all do the same. Um, and all these texts, maybe we can switch uh, briefly, uh, we can switch briefly to um, um, the subsequent slide. Um, yeah, all these texts, uh, and maybe, maybe even the subsequent one, because it's just an overview of all of the, precisely, all of the legal texts uh, out there. So all of these texts uh, state that union discrimination law will not prevent member states from adopting or maintaining measures to prevent or compensate for disadvantages linked to protected grounds. So pretty, pretty broad provision that is uh, both offered in the treaties and in all of the uh, EU uh, equality directives. However, uh, what we also see is that those regulations and treaties do not define what these positive action measures exactly may entail. So there's no precise definition. And that was left to clarify um, by the case law of the European Court of Justice. So uh, the core uh, uh, legal uh, actor within the European Union uh, context. And that court has dealt with positive action measures in by now about 10 to 12 cases, um, all of which were related uh, up until now to issues uh, pertaining to sex and gender in the context of employment, and sometimes explicitly in the context of academia uh, as well. And I'll focus on a few of those cases, um, not all of them, uh, since I already got a notice that I'm running out of time. Um, so I'll look at the core cases that really illustrate um, uh, the court's positive action doctrine as it is still valid uh, today. So if we turn to the following slide, we can already turn to the subsequent slide because I'll skip uh, Commission versus France, which is not that important. Kalanka, however, Kalanka is... Um, an essential case, an essential case in which the court really uh, elaborated its approach to uh, positive action for the first time in uh, detail. It's a case that dates from 1995. Um, and the decision um, established really the basic framework of the ECJ's uh, positive action doctrine that still holds uh, to this day. And the dispute concerned a positive action measure consisting of employment preferences granted to female candidates. And the preference was a tiebreaker preference. So women were granted uh, preference if they were equally qualified as men competing for a position where in the context where women were clearly underrepresented. Uh, and to the surprise of, of quite a few people, the court uh, held that that sex-based preference uh, violated the prohibition of direct discrimination on the grounds of sex to the extent that they were automatic, absolute and unconditional. So even a tiebreaker preference in itself, so that's not even one of the more far reaching forms of uh, preferential treatment, but even a tiebreaker preference, the court considered to be uh, unjustified and considered to be discriminatory. Uh, the court said that the use of this type of preferential treatment for women um, was a departure from the general principle of equal treatments on the grounds of gender. And the court was concerned that the way in which the regulation gave automatic preference to women in case in which they were equally qualified appeared to yield direct sex discrimination vis-a-vis -vis men. Um, and therefore, despite the fact that the regulation was intended to remedy disadvantages faced by women as a result of past discrimination and ongoing discrimination even, the ECJ said that the regulation fell outside of the scope of permissible uh, positive action. After the Kalanka uh, decision, so I think we can turn to the next slide. 
1997 case of Marshall uh, is probably the court's most important positive action ruling. So it's a, it's a cornerstone of the court's positive action doctrine that, that clarified and, and, and completed the system of scrutiny of positive action measures that was uh, developed in Kalanka. Uh, and here the dispute involved a system of uh, preferences, again, for equally qualified women, so uh, a tiebreaker preference, competing for employment in public office where women were underrepresented. So up until there, the, the, the situation was pretty similar pretty similar to, uh, um, to the, uh, uh, the Kalanka one. However, there was a difference as well. Uh, what distinguished the positive action policy in Marshall was the presence of a so-called saving clause. So saving clause, uh, now what's a saving clause? A saving clause is an explicit rule that allows employers to, to override a preference based on gender, uh, um, even in case of equal qualifications if the personal characteristics of the male candidate, so uh, the, the dominant, uh, the representative of the dominant uh, group, tilts the balance in his favor uh, after all. Um, so it's, it's kind of a tweaked tiebreaker uh, preference. Uh, and the court says that this form of tiebreaker preference, this form of preferential treatment is acceptable. Uh, so according to the court, um, a system of, of, of sex-based preferences containing such a saving clause um, does not guarantee that that prohibited absolute or unconditional uh, unconditional priority to women um, if in each individual case it provides, so this is a quote, in each individual case it provides for male candidates who are equally qualified as the female candidates uh, a guarantee that the candidatures will be the subject of an objective assessment that will take into account all criteria specific to the individual candidates and that will override the priority accorded to female candidates where one or more of those criteria tilt the balance in favor of the male uh, candidates. Um, maybe turn to the subsequent slide. Yeah. Um, so accordingly, the, the court uh, also uh, elaborated upon why it accepted this for uh, the, this form of positive action. Uh, namely, says the court, it's to counteract the prejudicial effects on female candidates of prejudices and stereotypes concerning the role and capacities of women in uh, working life. So the court explicitly elaborates upon the fact that, again, I quote, the mere fact that a male candidate and a female candidate are equally qualified does not mean that they have the same chances, the same opportunities. This, says the court, due to the employer's rational or irrational fears that women will interrupt their careers more frequently, that owing to household and family duties, they will be less flexible in their working hours, or that they can be, and that they will be absent from work more frequently because of pregnancy, childbirth, and uh, breastfeeding. So since these stereotypes, says the court, since these stereotypes are often hidden, they're concealed during a decision-making process, uh, and they're very difficult to be proven, preferential treatment may be needed to, to reduce the actual instances of inequality. So it, it's, it's important to take that frame of mind of the court into, into account. So basically what the court says is formal equality is, is the principle, is, 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 is the point of departure, but sometimes due to prejudices that exist in society, formally equality may need a nudge, uh, may need a little push in order for it to really be, uh, uh, to be realized. And therefore you get this very slight, very small uh, leeway, this very small um, um, space for positive action to be uh, enacted. Um, another important uh, case is the case of Badek, um, but let's see in the chat how many, uh, how, how much time do I have? Five minutes. Okay, maybe uh, I, I can, uh, I think I can still fit it in. So Badek is an interesting case. Um, I'd advise you, all of you, uh, to, to, to read it. It's a very complicated set of positive action measures, um, of which I'll only discuss two. Um, but the, the first of these, these uh, the first two of these measures required preferential treatment to be given to women in the initial stages of recruitment. So before the actual hiring decision. Uh, and more specifically, uh, it involved a predetermined number of training positions that would be reserved for female candidates. Um, a second measure entailed a preferential treatment for women in case of equal qualification in actual recruitment. However, as in the Marshall case, the eventual outcome 
of the selection procedure didn't necessarily end up favoring equally qualified female candidates because it could be overridden for reasons of greater legal weight uh, as, the, uh, as the formulation. So in other words, again, as in Marshall, there was a saving clause. And the ECJ decided for all of these requirements that they did not involve giving women automatic preference over men. And so that this form of positive action was acceptable, could be accepted under European Union law. Uh, and most interestingly, it uh, accepted the fact that a number of reserved training spots for a job did not exclude men from places of uh, employment. Why? Because the court says, well, training spots are not themselves jobs. Uh, so the mere fact that you get to train for a job doesn't mean you get the job and that there's therefore, by predetermining a set number of positions for women in that, in that initial stage, um, that it excludes men from the final position. It just improves the chances of the female candidates to uh, acquire that uh, employment. Um, and the courts also accepted for, uh, for reasons of the fact that it was relatively flexible in, in case that um, uh, women couldn't be found. It was possible for more than half of the places uh, reserved for women to be taken by men. Uh, and the court also uh, um, uh, really underlines the fact that similar training positions were available elsewhere outside of the company so that men were still in the position, still in the possibility to receive the required training to finally uh, eventually and potentially get uh, the job. And the rest of the positive action policy, of course, was very similar to Marshall, and therefore the court also said it was acceptable since the preference was not absolute, uh, absolute because there was this uh, saving clause. A very final case that we'll uh, briefly look at is the case of Abramson. Uh, the case of Abramson basically reconfirmed uh, again that giving an automatic or a quasi-automatic uh, preference to females uh, will still be a violation of the principle of gender equality under European Union law. Uh, the Abramson case um, revolved around um, employment positive action policies in academic institutions that gave a strong preference, uh, a minimal fitness preference really to female candidates on account of them being underrepresented. So if female candidates possessed sufficient qualifications for the specific uh, post, they were in principle hired. Uh, so like I said, a minimal fitness test, and there wasn't any saving clause. And accordingly, the courts in line with its, uh, with its previous case law rejected the measure. It said that the measure couldn't be justified as a positive action uh, exception because the evaluation process was not uh, proportionate, was not transparent, and the measure didn't uh, provide for a uh, saving clause. So if we summarize, if we switch to uh, the final uh, slide on the case law, um, oh, even the, the following one. Um, ECJ case law is pretty strict, uh, as, as I said at the outset. Uh, it accepts positive action if the measure, firstly, is aimed at compensating for past disadvantages. Secondly, if it's a sector in which women are clearly underrepresented, you must be able to show the underrepresentation, well, logical, um, that it only gives priority to equally qualified female candidates over male candidates. So tiebreaker is the maximum what you can do, um, and it must remain flexible. So positive action may not, even in the case of a tiebreaker uh, preference, give automatic or unconditional priority to equally qualified candidates of the underrepresented sex. It must include a possibility of granting exceptions in cases um, due to the fact that individual situations and merit is taken into account uh, based on the pers personal situation of uh, the candidate. Um, now, if we switch to the following slide, um, there's quite a few um, questions that remain. Well, the, the first question that remains is, of course, equal. If 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 tiebreaker preference is is the most that you can uh, that you can have, what does it mean to be equally qualified? Uh, that that might be something that the debate uh, later on this evening uh, could uh, could focus on as well, because in the European case law, it's not entirely clear. Uh, because well, there's no such thing as entirely equal, uh, formally equal, identical uh, qualifications. There's always differences. Uh, no one has the exact 
uh, same education no one has the exact same types uh, and quality of publications etc um, so what you see in the case law as well is that it doesn't have to be strict identity it doesn't have to be strict equality on the level of traditional qualification or on the level of achievement or, or experience it can also involve potential uh, talent uh, that is not traditionally demonstrated, uh, even taking into account systemic barriers faced by uh, women. So you must read uh, equal qualifications uh, more exactly as similar rather than truly uh, identical. Uh, so that's the first point. Other um, points, of course, uh, like I said, the, the case law by the court is pretty strict. Um, but it's only strict for the fields uh, for which European Union law is uh, relevant. Uh, so as soon as you step outside of the strict context of, of classical employment, uh, there's often much more room for positive action measures. And you can point, for instance, in that regards to the common practice in, 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 in quite a few U European countries to have quota, hard quota, in the boards of companies. Uh, so several, uh, a whole host of European countries, including Belgium, Iceland, France, Italy, Norway, uh, and the other Scandinavian countries have legislation in place that guarantee attaining a minimum percentage in Belgium uh, for the time being, it's a third, I think, um, of an underrepresented gender. So it cuts both ways. Uh, Norway was the first country to do so or so. I think it was it introduced it in 2006 already with a 40% um, um, minimum. Um, and there's even a draft EU directive from 2011 or 2012, uh, I forget the exact uh, year, uh, which aims at 40%, although it's been stuck at the European uh, level for some time now, it hasn't been, uh, hasn't been enacted. Um, likewise, in the political context, uh, uh, gender quota have also in many countries been introduced, most often on the level of the candidatures, on the level of the candidates list. Uh, and that too escapes the strict context of employment because, well, political jobs aren't jobs, or at least not elected political jobs are not jobs in the sense of union law, and therefore much more is possible. Uh, but also in employment, rules are much more flexible when it doesn't concern uh, direct access to uh, employment or promotion. And we saw that in, in the case of Badek as well. If you have a short list uh, that, can, uh, that can be allowed in the pre-selection phase. Uh, it also concerns supporting measures concerning childcare, for instance, there you can give the benefit to uh, women as well. Um, but, and, and with that, I'll, uh, I'll end up because I think I'm, uh, I've uh, transgressed my, uh, my time already. Um, what's interesting as well is that many things also remain unclear. Uh, so the court hasn't really pronounced itself on a number of things. Uh, the boards of, of companies, for instance, uh, the court hasn't yet had the opportunity to pronounce itself on it. Will it really see boards as falling outside of the context of employment? There's elements in the case of Badek that suggests that it might not have found such uh, things legitimate. Uh, if you read that case, you see that there was a quotum of 50% in a representative organ. Uh, and the court only says, well, I'm not going to evaluate it because it permits that other criteria can be taken into account and that the quotum is not really a quotum. But what if, uh, uh, if a case were presented to, uh, to the court uh, in which those uh, company board quota would be uh, would be put at issue. We, we've yet to see there's arguments in both uh, ways that could um, uh, that could uh, count to either permit it or not. Uh, what about very strong financial incentives? That, that's something that I find very interesting myself. I know of a university, I will not name any names, uh, within Belgium that has um, installed a system of strong financial incentives to hire women in professorial positions. So if a woman is hired, she immediately gets, uh, and the faculty that hires her immediately gets a significant sum of money. Is that allowable? Is that granting easier access to women? Is that, uh, is that, is that a nudge that might be so strong a nudge that it could uh, well incite to 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 discrimination or is that is that just a measure that doesn't run into european union law we we haven't seen that be be tested by um, by the european court so we don't know for sure um and there's a, a number of other uh, interesting 
uh, issues as well. I'll just finally wind up with the very last uh, element is that uh, you, you'll have noticed and I also said it at the very beginning that all of the case law up until now by the European Court of Justice pertains to the context of employment, but also especially pertains to um, gender, pertains to sex. So all of the other grounds that since uh, the year 2000 uh, have had uh, directives issued, uh, race, religion, disability, uh, etc. cetera, um, will the exact same criteria hold? Uh, will the courts apply the exact same criteria for positive action vis-a-vis -vis those um, discrimination grounds as well? Or will it, for instance, for disability, because we all know that many countries have uh, explicit quota concerning disability in public uh, in public uh, public service um, will it somehow install a different a different assess assessment and maybe more flexible ass assessment method uh, for these uh, for these other grounds uh, we've yet to uh, to see how the court will uh, will deal with that so for now I'll uh, I'll uh, quit and uh, I'll leave the uh, floor to the subsequent speaker So thank you very much to uh, Professor Bieling for this very interesting and thought-provoking um, lecture. We've already received a number of questions, so we'll get back to you later on. Um, but now we'll give the floor to our next speaker, Andrea Bade, um, from our staff services, uh, our diversity policy office at KU Leuven. Andrea, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. And first of all, thank you to Lean In and Undivided. Uh, for organizing this debate. Uh, I'll try to limit my time uh, and maybe make it a little shorter so that there's enough time for the debate. Um, as a start and to provide some context, I will, I will briefly present a current state of affairs uh, of KU Leuven's gender action plans and, and positive actions. And you can go to the next slide. Um, and press also next, yes. Um, let's start from the data first. Um, as both on the Flemish level and here at KU Leuven, gender action plans are strongly informed by data and monitoring. So this, this must be our starting uh, point. Now the figure uh, which you see, of which the data is also online available, plots the percentage of men and women across various stages of academic career. So from master students to PhD, postdoc, and then assistant professor to full professor. And as in all European countries, uh, countries, this shows a decline for women as career stages advance, uh, while the corresponding curve for men arises. And the goal of, of our gender policy is so to say to, to close these scissors. Um, and we've been monitoring this for years and slowly, uh, but sadly, but slowly, uh, they are closing uh, every year a little more. And next. We do see um, that in our recent appointments of professors, that while women are 30% of the candidates, they are 40% of the newly appointed uh, professors. And women and men also have equal chances of being promoted. Now, while these numbers are, are hopeful, progression remains slow when you look at the senior academic staff as a whole, certainly uh, the top levels. In part, we are limited here by the structure of academic careers that people are appointed almost always as an assistant professor, and it takes decades to reach uh, the rank of full professor. Moreover, uh, we've set ourselves the target figure of 50% in the new professor appointments. Um, and uh, we were at 40 this year, uh, a few years ago, we were at 50, but this uh, differs. Next. Now, the gender action plans um, at K. Leuven which have been in place since 1989, no, 98, are aimed at closing uh, this so-called scissor diagram. And our current gender action plan is shared uh, with the other Flemish universities and drawn up together with the, the Young Academy. It focuses on, on five lines of action, which I, I don't have the possibility to discuss in detail. Uh, but you can find it on our website. Um, and the first one is, is raising awareness on gender inequality and implicit biases. Uh, second, uh, developing recruitment and promotion procedures, uh, which are open, transparent, and merit-based, and which biases at all stages are uh, prevented. Third, uh, working towards gender-balanced representation in leadership and policy bodies, uh, meaning a third of each gender currently. 
Fourth, ensuring that people can facilitate a healthy balance between work and private life, in which career breaks do not affect career chances. And finally, uh, extensive monitoring of gender data uh, to identify barriers and to ensure accountability. Um, we've, uh, now, within the, the, the context of tonight, the stance of Koei Leuven and by extension, the Flemish University Council uh, on positive action uh, is an important context. Um, and as you can infer from the gender action plan I've outlined, the focus of gender policy in Kieleuven makes limited use of hard quotas. Um, rather than focusing on, on the quantitative results, the policy plans are focused on changing uh, the institutional culture and structures. Um, and this corresponds partly to what um, Professor Freeling called positive fairness and inclusive policies. Now, this is a long term work to ensure that our structures at all levels provide equal opportunities for people of all backgrounds. And one example here are our gender vanguards. Um, they sit on each faculty advisory committee, which is the committee that appoints new professors. And their gender vanguard is um, a member who prevents the gender sensitivity of the discussion of the assessment procedure and whose task it is to prevent implicit biases from influencing the procedure. Um, now, while gender vanguards were originally asked to focus on gender biases, their role in practice has evolved to encompass implicit biases in, in general. A second aspect here is that we work towards facilitating a qual qualitative and holistic assessment of application files. Uh, so people are asked to report effective work time so that this is the base of the assessment. Um, there are, however, some hard quotas in place. Um, in a few boards, uh, the, this is a hard quota. And we've also recently introduced a measure that faculty boards and exam, doctoral exam committees cannot consist of only men or only women. And for other bodies, we have soft quotas in place or target figures of one third of each uh, sex. Um, now, this is not to say that more extensive or, or further going forms of positive actions um, are not being considered. Um, if, if I go back to the, the scissor diagram, I discussed that among the, the senior professors, so the professors and full professors, progress is very slow and it's an ongoing debate of how and if we can speed this up rather than awaiting the process of recently uh, or the, the progression of recently appointed professors in, in their career, because this will take uh, some time. And here, positive actions might be a part of the solution. Uh, if, yeah, and moving to the next slide. Um, if we broaden the scope on, on gender policy to, to other diversity characteristics um, and their intersection, I will briefly refer to our current diversity policy where with regard to staff, current priorities are the development uh, or the, of policy regarding staff and students with an LGD, LGTBQ background. And we're also exploring policy initiatives regarding um, barriers in the recruitment and career development of staff with a migration background. Um, and next to that, our policy has, has focused on internationalization and inclusion of staff with a disability. Now, in general, we do encounter here an important uh, challenge. Um, as I said, monitoring is the base of, of good policy and, and also for positive actions and monitoring their effectiveness, um, which is also an important requirement for uh, our legal condition for positive actions. Um, which is that outside of, of gender and nationality, other diversity characteristics are not systematically registered and therefore monitored. And the legal and practical uh, conditions to monitoring these are very difficult. Um, so this is a, a challenge for us and also our colleagues of other universities. Um, and at KU Leuven, we've, we've tried to overcome this by allowing staff to identify themselves as someone with a disability or migration background or international background in our uh, employee satisfaction monitor, which takes place every three years. And in this way, we, for the first time, try to map barriers in career progression and inclusion um, in order to, to develop uh, or, or to ensure that our policies are data informed and, and focus on the right uh, career stages, for example. In, in 
developing this um, further also towards the future, we also look at our student policy, where together with the other Flemish universities, monitoring instruments have been developed based upon a self-registration when you inscribe as, as a student uh, at the university, uh, which allows to, to monitor um, uh, student groups of different backgrounds and, and provide tailored support uh, and recruitment uh, uh, when necessary. So this is a very quick um, and general background of the context in which we are working and, and of the debate. And as I said, it's very much uh, remains a work in progress to make sure our university is a reflection of, of society. And I'm looking forward uh, to an inspiring debate in, uh, in that regard. Thank you very much, Andrea, as well, um, for the uh, overview of what's currently being done at KU Leuven. Um, I'll give the floor to um, Dr. Yusra Benski, who's going to be our moderator. And then maybe before we delve into the panel, to the panelists very, very briefly, given the time, um, so they can give a very quick introduction on themselves. Um, I'll give the floor to Yusra. Yes, uh, thank you, Marie. Uh, thank you. Um, wait, is there a way that I can see? The speakers or not yet, maybe. Uh, is there, because I'm not the best technical expert, so I see a lot of screens and just a few ones of the speakers. Is there a way for me to only see the speakers? I think you can go to, um, so on the, the right, the top right corner, there's a button and you can switch between, a button and you can switch between views. Mm -hmm. And either of those, I should have pinned the speakers, at least those who have started their videos. Um, yeah, but it's okay. Um, it's not. It's not. Can, can can other participants and the debaters see each other now? Yeah. They should be pinned to. Okay. I I don't see everyone, so I have. I think I have the same problem as Yusra. Yeah. Okay, and can you? Can you see on the on the top right corner of your screen, there is this view button where you can switch between. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make a difference. No. So no. Ah, um, wait, maybe Yusra, did you did you change to um, speaker view? So like the it's like the second. Ah, yes. Yeah. Now, so now I see you when you speak. That's what I need, right? Um, because otherwise it's a lot of screens anyway. Sorry, that was not the most eloquent <laughs> start. Um, but um, uh, first of all, maybe let me thank uh, Joachim and Andrea. I think that's a good background that we got there, the more legal, sophisticated, detailed analysis, which I think can provide a discussion with that legal nuance background, which doesn't appear as straightforward as it sometimes may seem. And at the same time, the more practical policy uh, perspective of uh, the caregiver. Um, before we start, as Marie has rightly said, um, I would like the speakers to shortly introduce themselves so that uh, the attendees know who we have the honor of having with us tonight. So maybe, um, Dunia, you can start and then the rest can follow. Yes, uh, good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Dunia Boraben. I'm a PhD researcher uh, in uh, or at the sociology department of the Vrije Universiteit Brussel. Um, and I'm also a teaching uh, assistant there for uh, the Bachelor of Social Sciences. Um, well, uh, I am currently doing research on um, everyday uh, gender racism and everyday sexism um, at the uh, Flemish higher education institutions. Um, and um, I am uh, on the one hand looking at the experiences of female early career researchers from different uh, backgrounds and at the same time also looking at uh, gender and racial attitudes from um, uh, those in management uh, positions to try and, and create a, a whole picture on uh, the situation in the academy. Uh, so I'm, I'm very interested in participating to this uh, panel uh, today and uh, thank you Nosiswe uh, and Undivided and Dean in Law Leuven to uh, invite me for this uh, panel. Thank you, Dunia. I think uh, it's safe to say that we're at least as happy to have you on board. Um, maybe Namfundo? 
Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ndom Pondo. I'm a PhD candidate at Oxford from South Africa. Um, my research is primarily on uh, affirmative action in South Africa, but my, I'm currently doing a comparative analysis um, on some of the legal sort of instruments uh, looking at the United States, India, which is the oldest affirmative action regime in the world. Um, with South Africa. So asking some of those technical questions that uh, started our conversation today is like, what is a quota and, and what is a quota that is permissible, what is not? And sort of looking at the different approaches comparatively to figure out what will fit um, sort of the South African particular desire to redress something as big as colonial and apartheid um, sort of domination and oppression through a tool like affirmative action. Um, and I'm really excited to, to be here today and I hope I can be helpful um, even from a comparative experience. Wonderful, uh, very, very interesting research. I think you've already touched upon a very tricky issue, the one of quota versus that entire legacy of structural oppression and how do those um, in any way uh, tie in with one another. And I think that's also one of the advantages of, of online meeting is that we can have someone like you so easily with us tonight. So I think, um, again, quite a privilege, um, perhaps uh, Deb. Yes, good evening, everyone. Um, I am the, currently the, the HR director of KU Leuven. And um, I am, um, well, um, how would I say this? I, I, I would like to be inspired tonight. I would like to, to, uh, to uh, hear um, um, some new ideas in, in how we can further improve our, our gender policy and uh, the gender policy that Andrea described. Uh, we have worked, uh, worked it out together, the HR department and the diversity team uh, of KU Leuven, together, of course, with all the faculties and so on. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm really here to, to, to listen to all of you and to hear also um, um, good, uh, good ideas and, and bring in some, some of the things that we also tried in K Leuven and that did work out well, but also some of the things that we tried and didn't work at all. <laughs> so maybe we can exchange a bit of these more, more uh, practical um, uh, things that we have tried uh, at, at KU Leuven and, and inspire each other in, in, in this way. Okay, wonderful. Uh, I think that perspective is uh, equally uh, interesting as a more academic one, so no need uh, for you to shy away into only listening. I think uh, everyone will be curious to hear what has been successful and what, what, has, what hasn't. And then finally, uh, Lisbeth. Hello, good evening. So my name is Lisbeth Stevens. Um, I am a proud alumni of the KU Leuven. I studied there law many years ago. Uh, and then I wrote a doctoral thesis on the criminal legislation on sexual violence. Since then, I have um, always had a, a small academic career at KU Leuven, but I've been mostly uh, invested in a policymaking career, first as a member of the staff of uh, several government members, and since 2014 as the deputy director of the Belgian Institute for the Equality of Women and Men, which is the equality body for gender in Belgium. And as such, we are uh, dealing with issues like quota and gender equality uh, as, a, as a whole um, daily, on a daily basis. So thank you very much for having me uh, here tonight. Wonderful. Um, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll quickly uh, introduce myself uh, as well. Um, my name is Yusra Benfki. I have a background uh, in, in law as well, in human rights law more in particular. My master's in, in general law, but a second master's in human rights law. And I recently uh, defended my PhD successfully, and I'm currently working uh, at the Hannah Arendt Institute as a valorization coordinator. And I'm very happy to be able to uh, guide discussion uh, today. To start that off, uh, maybe we can do that with a teaser, something you will all certainly have heard of with, because it is often used uh, in debates. Um, and just to throw that in there and get a feel of where you stand, um, which is by imposing quota, um, women or other outside groups only get a specific function because they are women or members of that particular out group and not because of their merit. Um, maybe a quick round of thoughts on that one. Um, I'm not going to always uh, say who's going to go first, so just feel free to uh, pitch in and speak when you feel ready. Um, unless, of course, everyone remains quiet and then I'll have to, <laughs> yeah. I can start, I, I guess. Um, 
Well, uh, yes, indeed, uh, Yusra, this is a, a very common argument uh, that mainly opponents use uh, when talking about quota, but also other forms of uh, affirmative action. And I think the issue with this argument and, and just with uh, this, this argument of, that opponents uh, provide is that it starts from um, the, the belief that we live in a merits-based society, yeah? that we live in a meritocracy where everyone who just works hard, who has the, the right talents and skills and really wants to achieve something will achieve it. Uh, so everything we get in life is based on individual merit and thus an equal share or inequality uh, should only be the result of the lack of merit which of course justifies then inequality. And, and therefore opponents then argue that within a meritocracy, quota is unnecessary because that would mean that um, these positions would be provided to individuals who are untalented and don't have the right skills and that it would be just a result of luck that they get there. And I think also uh, that, that the concept of luck is, is very important here because um, as I al already mentioned, uh, I also conducted research on everyday sexism and racism in academia. And most of the women that I talked to um, also mentioned how in their first um, um, interactions with their colleagues um, that they got to hear how lucky they must be to, to um, have gotten this position. And this is not because of, of quota, but just of, because of gender policies in general. Um, so uh, this idea that we have of living in a meritoc meritocratic society um, also means that we, we start from a so perceived neutral conceptualization of what merit and excellence um, um, is. And I think that is very relevant within academic organizations because um, these institutions are uh, often portraying itself as an institution where merit is the first thing that they are uh, looking at. Um, but we um, often tend to forget that um, the institution is built around an invisible norm. Um, and, and therefore, in my work, I, I define um, academia as a gendered and racialized organization or as an inequality regime, as, as uh, would be said in, uh, in, in uh, sociology. Um, and, and by saying th this, I mean that uh, academia was originally built to educate uh, the white male elite. Um, and now uh, we still see that the labor processes and the characteristics are still built around that masculine and that white norm, but it just has become invisible. And so the, that, that's where, where the problem lies in the, in the first place, uh, that merits is perceived to be universally achieved by everyone, but that's not the case because as we see, male candidates are often considered to be more fit um, because uh, they have the right abilities to be um, 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 uh, an academic than a female uh, candidate. So this argument uh, that, that women who are appointed by a system of quota um, do not have the merits could be counter-argued if um, academia in, in the first place um, is going to acknowledge that they are a gendered uh, and a racialized uh, organization. So I think uh, that is one of the, the, the first things that we need to, to acknowledge. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a very excellent uh, a reflection to start with. Um, anyone wants to add to that? Well, maybe I can just uh, add, this is an argument that is very often presented and I have to be careful every time that I hear it, not to roll with my eyes because we still need to have a discussion. Um, and uh, our colleague already um, explained a lot about, I think when opponents or real opponents uh, present the argument, but what the thing that I find really puzzling is that um, I often get the argument of women who could actually be in a position to benefit from quota. And they tell me, I don't want quota because then I will be considered as not being qualified. And um, the two things I tell them is one, it's not about you. It's about, which is a hard message, but it's about the system. Uh, you're not getting this position because you are you. We as a society or as a system are deciding that this uh, lack of, of representation or lack of women in that particular um, uh, position is a problem and therefore we are having quota but it could be woman a or b or c so this isn't about you um i i very often feel and i don't know how to because i i want to take that into account i have i very often have the feeling that it's also a way for high potential women 
to claim that they belong to the system, that they don't attack or question the system at a time when it's probably very wise not to attack the system. Um, so that is, I think, the double bind they are in, um, or the catch-22 they are in. Um, and of course, it could be a real fear of certain women uh, to that, that they that they will not be considered as really qualified. But then I usually try to uh, assure them by saying, "Well, this is only a chance that you get, and you will still have to prove that you uh, are." worthy of this of this position and you will still i mean this will not be the end of your for example academic career you will still have to uh, do all the work and and um, and and make uh, uh, your further career it is often a question of getting a, a first chance uh, to this to this position so the the argument is uh, is very tiresome i would love to, to be <laughs> illegal <laughs> i'm sure there's a problem with that <laughs> I, I thought to start with the most tiring argument and then we can delve into the depths of the discussion. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Dunia, on the merit and, and the neutral conceptualization of merit and Lisbeth on that um, the, 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 the women themselves uh, also uh, sometimes having those same um, fears. Um, is there anything that Deb and Namfunda want to add or is everything said uh, in this regard? Maybe from a practical point of view, I, what, what I see is, although you might be very reluctant to use quota, that once you, you use quota, hard or soft quota, whatever, that um, it's, it's always surprising to see that all of a sudden women can be find, found uh, that, that otherwise would not have the, the opportunity to, to, uh, to um, uh, go to a commission or or what we also see is that in in uh, many um, of the application procedures we um, we see that women sometimes uh, do not see themselves as suitable candidates and um, um, unless someone invites them or does a proposal or uh, so um, in that sense sense uh, quota can can really be very helpful and we have very good experiences also with with uh, for example soft quota for our search committees where um, we um, the the number of candidates uh, is is we really set the number of candidates for a vacancy for for professors for example is is fixed and they have to to reach that number in order to uh, go further on with with the vacancy procedure so that really means that that um, and it's it's very helpful. Um, um, also, uh, then you see that yeah, uh, the um, from a practical point of view, I think it's very useful to to implement quota. But we have to be very careful also um, in how we implement them, and and maybe also the 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 the, the perverse effects of it, or no, or how you really uh, well implementation of quota might be. Yeah. We just discuss later on. Yeah, exactly. That's uh, we were gonna delve into yeah. the depths of that immediately after this. I was just uh, aiming to to have an idea on that um, mm -hmm. basic argument that is often yeah. heard. Um, you mean on fundo uh, something final to add before we go on? Yeah, I mean, I think starting off from what Dunia pointed out, and and this is a question about you know the question assumes that merit. Um, is objective and neutral. And there's a lot of work that's shown that actually merit just reflects the dominant culture's norms and values. And it, then everybody else is measured against that standard. But even if, you know, say in an ideal world, it was possible for us to have absolutely objective criteria, um, the other question that comes about is, are there some things that are more important in individual merit and efficiency in society that a jurisdiction uh, or country might say, this is something that is particularly important to us, even though we, we understand merit, we are in an ideal society where we can measure it objectively and neutrally, but we care more about redressing historic injustice um, because of, you know, patriarchy or white supremacy and sort of uh, then a government saying we want policies that sort of um, give this priority over this sort of meritocratic world. And I think that's just one thing that I, I wanted to add there. Yeah. I think that's a wonderfully interesting uh, addition because it also moves us out of the way, um, out of the framework um, that um, 
uh, establishes merit as the predominant criterion in the first place. And I think it's in interesting for us to actually uh, move outside of that box potentially. Um, um, so a wonderful uh, addition. Um, okay, so the idea was just to throw on a little teaser, but actually the discussion is already very much full on and going. So that's amazing. I think we only have to watch a little bit um, um, our time because the speakers um, before you already, um, um, I mean, we have a small delay, so maybe we can, um, we'll have to check the time now and then, but um, we, we are still very much safe right now. Um, so if we now um, delve into the discussion a bit further, um, and we seem to agree that quota uh, are necessary or do have a place within broader equality policies, um, the question becomes, what are the basic conditions then for quota? to work and to be effective. Um, do you know of good practices perhaps? Do we speak of soft or hard quota, things that have already been mentioned before? Um, and maybe tied into that at the same time, what are potential risks as Deb has already pointed out if those conditions are not met? Um, so I know it's a lot, um, but it's basically just in what conditions do you see quota work? And what happens if those conditions are not met? Um, are the consequences perhaps um, even more harmful? Um, so, Let's let's uh, let's delve in. Feel free to start. Maybe I can go first because we I think we have quite some practical experience from the the institute on this uh, on this question. Um, I have um, four um, conditions that I think should absolutely be be met for uh, for quota to work. Um, Quick, before you uh, delve into those four conditions, I just got uh, the message from Oziswe that we are fine on time so that we don't have to compensate for, uh, so just uh, okay. don't, don't have to feel rushed. And I think that's okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So the first, um, what we see in practice is that you need a firm legal sanction or a, a sanction uh, for quota to work. And I, uh, I dare to say that because I can compare two quota, gender quota, that are in place in, in Belgium as of now. Um, it's like uh, one on the one hand, the quota in companies, but we also have a quotum on a higher civil servants, a one that is much less known than uh, the one for companies. We see that even the one for companies is um, sometimes difficult to, to uh, have it sanctioned and to have it implemented. But the one for higher civil servants is even more difficult because it has, it lacks a firm legal sanction. Um, in, in theory, there even is one, um, but it's very difficult to, to get it applied. And uh, because it basically means that an, a nomination of another civil servant would be uh, considered um, void and uh, and then the procedure would be uh, done over. But um, so that's the first uh, absolutely necessary condition, I would say, that you need a, a framework with, with firm sanctions. The second one is, I mean, this is going to sound really basic, but you need a follow-up system. You need someone to say, well, you're not doing what you should be doing according to this quota. And so we are going to make you uh, implement the sanctions or we are going to um, make sure that the sanctions are uh, applied. And again, this will probably sound very basic, but for example, for the quota in, in companies in Belgium, for now, we do not know who is um, qualified to, to make sure that companies follow this. And we are highly depending on, um, on the self-regulation of the, the companies to apply uh, these quota. Um, the third condition, I would say, and, and Jochum has already uh, um, commented on that, is that we, we absolutely need a discussion, or you need I, not even a discussion, we should just bypass the strict definition of what is equal qualifications. Um, what works, we find, is, is to have at least have candidates um, put into categories. So don't make a list of this one is the best and this one is the second best and this one is the third best because it's it, one, it generates um, discussions, very, very difficult discussions. And also it, it's, I mean, it will not allow for a situation in which you can say, okay, they might not be identical qualifications, but they are similar and they are similar enough. So if you have quota and you have to have a system to uh, um, apply them, make sure that the candidates are grouped in categories um, of qualification and not in a strict list. Um, 
And the, the fourth that I would uh, condition that I would very much uh, hope for is that we could um, surpass the 30%. And I know where it comes from. And I know, I mean, it's the minimum minimum for, for uh, uh, um, making a move towards uh, equal representation. But we really need more. Um, I know, and I'm not sure how, uh, why this ar argument uh, um, has merit legally, but I know that the Belgian, the Belgian um, legislator said, well, we will only have a 40% uh, quota. No, it's, it, I'm sorry, it was the constitutional court, I think he said, well, because there is only a 40% quotum, that's okay. It would be a problem if you would have a 50% quotum because you still have you you still need to have some room for maneuvering. But to me, this 40% is an absolute um, minimum that we we should no longer accept 30%. We should really move forward to 40% as a, a basis for quota. Okay, thank you, Lisbeth, for kicking that off uh, really well. Um, other thoughts. Um, maybe I can add uh, one of the, the the conditions, or yeah, one of the conditions that that would uh, lead to effective quota, and that is that if we talk about quota, we are usually talking about uh, how it can reduce discrimination and how it can catch up with uh, the exclusion of of uh, members from uh, the targeted group uh, in the past. Um, but these quota should actually also serve to uh, reduce the negative stereotypes that already exist among employers, uh, key constituents, their colleagues, peers, and so on eh, over these targeted groups. And um, that means that if we want effective quota, it cannot be quota that, that leads to um, the so-called patronizing equilibrium, eh, that is quota that just leads to short-term positive effects, but it does not produce any negative stereotypes, and which are the problem in the first place. Um, and especially when quota is considered to be um, forced upon uh, employers uh, to hire people from a certain group, um, we really need to touch upon why they do not want to hire these people in the first place. Um, and, and I think that is important because when the policy would be removed, we will most probably um, uh, go again into this discriminatory situation, uh, that this discriminatory situation will just revive um, again. And therefore, we really need to look at um, the, the statistical and the taste-based discrimination that is happening in the labor market and why there is this risk aversion and how we can uh, remove the stereotypes. Because there is research that shows that the quota that we are using now uh, that is used for just a short time until we reach uh, that 30% or more, um, that the, this does not remove uh, stereotypes about these people even after hiring. And I think that is, is, is quite a danger, uh, I believe. Um, but I would also like to uh, just shortly mention also some risks um, related to quota that um, the, the respondents and the women in my research uh, have uh, mentioned. Um, and uh, one of them is, is the one that I, I shortly uh, discussed earlier on, eh, that when they uh, uh, get hired, uh, that the first thing they hear is that they must be lucky to be here eh, because it's, it's uh, uh, not because of their merits uh, uh, and their abilities, but, but just because of their gender that they arrived here. And this uh, does not only affect the positive relationships that they want to create with supervisors and peers and colleagues, uh, which of course is, is very important uh, uh, for their job satisfaction and their motivation, but it also has a psychological effect on them um, because they start to doubt about the abilities and whether they belong in academia. And I think this is also something that we really should focus on. And, and another risk, the second risk that uh, most women discussed was related to the use of quota in boards and committees. Um, and especially when they are one of the few women in uh, their faculty, they often get uh, burdened with work because they need to sit down in all of these committees and all of these boards and they need to be members of all these juries within the faculty. And that actually sets them back in doing their work, uh, in, in doing work that is valuable for, for uh, and that is considered worthy uh, for their academic career. Eh? So uh, conducting research, producing output and so on. And also because this kind of work as uh, sitting in uh, boards is not considered valuable uh, for one CV. And I think that uh, therefore a quota should not only be about counting bodies, uh, counting how many women there are in the faculty, but it should also be focusing on what are the long-term positive effects on their academic career that we also should take uh, that into consideration 
and that it might not uh, be counterproductive to, uh, to their academic career um, at the end. Um, so that's just what I uh, wanted to add. I think uh, also very valuable addition, something I also uh, painfully recognized from my own academic career. So um, maybe Deb and Omfundo, I see you nodding and, and I'm sure that you have uh, reflections to, to share. Similar experience uh, with, with uh, the full professors at KU Leuven, the, the women, they are really, it's really a perverse effect of the, of the quota uh, to some extent eh, in, in, in that they uh, are pushed to accept invitations and, and additional work. And that this additional work really is not not always uh, very beneficial for their further uh, long-term career. So that's really a, a thing, uh, something we have to take in, into account uh, when, when we are thinking about quota. Maybe I want to bring in something uh, in addition. I think quota is not enough. Uh, we, we all know that, but it's, it's, uh, it's also, um, um, uh, it's not because women are in a committee that less gender biased decisions are guaranteed. For example, eh? so female committees do not provide necessarily woman-friendly decisions, and so it's it's not only about who is in the committee, but it's also about making um, well counteracting every uh, every time again the implicit biases that are there in uh, all decision processes, and also also uh, uh, women eh? are are um, well are um, uh, to these biases, eh? I have these biases as well, yeah. I think also a very valid point that it is not only about the whom, but also the processes and the ways of decision making. And Amfundo, um, what are your uh, insights? Yeah, I mean, I, I think one thing that keeps coming up is this idea of like, sort of the stigma that women experience, um, or, uh, you know, black people, if we're talking about affirmative actions in South Africa, or lower caste, uh, people if we're talking about affirmative action in India and I think sort of the theory is two pronged so it looks at the internal stigma so what the beneficiaries themselves feel and then it also accounts for the external stigma so this is the idea of the prejudice and the stereotypes from the dominant groups um, who sort of direct sort of uh, the prejudice towards the beneficiaries and the empirical work in the Indian context as well as in the US shows that while there exists both external and internal stigma, um, quite a lot of beneficiaries um, still say that the benefits of these policies outweigh um, sort of the internal stigma. And sort of recent work in India has said, like a key intervention in this regard is to redress external stigma, right? So I think what Dunia was talking about is like really grappling with patriarchy, white supremacy, through targeted programs in the workplace or in higher education institutions to grapple with external stigma, which then has a positive impact on internal stigma. So if women are coming into environments um, that are de definitely committed to anti-racism or definitely committed to gender equality, they are less likely to have experiences of internal stigma because they're not coming into an environment where they face external stigma. So the intervention for one actually becomes sort of something to redress um, internal stigma. I think the risk about talking too much about internal stigma is that often this argument is used um, as a justification uh, to get rid of affirmative action. I mean, we know in the US, Justice Clarence Thomas and a lot of his judgments, he's been a key sort of driver of this argument that you know quotas and affirmative action harm the beneficiaries, so we should get rid of them. So I think we just always have to come back to nuancing this internal stigma issue because empirically the beneficiaries always say, though we do experience this, the benefits of these policies definitely outweigh um, sort of the harm. I think that's also a very valid uh, addition. I think uh, what um, the, the whole connection between internal and external stigma, internalization being dependent also on fighting external stigma. I think that that is a very important and um, um, the, um, also very correct that you point out that the danger of over focusing on that is that it is often used. You don't want to be hired because you're a woman or because you're a uh, woman of color, et cetera, et cetera. And so that can, that can become a double-edged sword in and of its own. So I think that's a very uh, important nuance um, that you add there. Um, I think, um, yeah, there's so much that's touched uh, upon here. Is there, do we have to, Lisbeth, and is there anything that you want to add again now that we've done the full round or anyone else that wants to react on what a colleague has said? Yes. 
I would like I would like to get the, the research that Nom Funda was talking about about the internal stigma and and especially the benefits outweigh the harm because um, I think that is important uh, material even in in day to day practice to to help women also to be to not succumb to this internal uh, stigma and there's actually also but it was on, only a small explorative research that says once you do have it was a, a little setup um, in a few companies and where they had an active policy to to nominate women as um, team leaders and they had measured how um, women and men in the companies were feeling about female team leaders before and after the policy and what they actually uh, noticed is that once a, a, a team had had a female leader on 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 the on the whole, the, the, they were a lot more positive afterwards than before. So quota can also it, it can also help to create experiences, positive experiences, not only for the ones that are benefiting from the quota, but from the the, the company or the organization as a whole to um, to sure. be yeah. more diverse. If I, I think uh, what you all have said. Um, ties in together quite nicely because if we start with what Lisbeth said, Ed sanctions follow up, um, I think we all agree. However, in those conditions, we don't really see the attention for external bias, right? And so I think there's the danger of over-focusing on sanctions and follow up and, and sanctions without really addressing the culture and, and the dominant biases. I think that's not what we want. But uh, if we add what Dunia and Onfundo have said with what uh, Lisbeth has pointed out, I think we can get to a more um, holistic policy of what quota can do and how they can do that. So I think you've been quite complimentary um, in that regard. Um, anyone else wants to add on from the way? I just want to add one last point. I, again, something that was said earlier, and I think one of the ways in which we can grapple with external stigma or sort of create environments that are uh, more sort of enabling um, is sort of participatory processes to drafting affirmative action policies. Um, so in South Africa, the employment legislation sort of requires almost a collective bargaining process uh, between all employ employees, uh, all trade unions and all affected parties. So the process of even coming up with what are the kinds of interventions, so quota being one, but other interventions as well. So employees agreeing that we're gonna have targeted training for, for juniors who belong to historically sort of marginalized groups and it being sort of an effort that comes from uh, the specific community itself. And that kind of involvement um, sort of has an impact on sort of when you bring the people into the workplace, you bring them into a workplace that is more open to these policies because the people who are affected by them have been a part of the processes of drafting them. So that's one of the, the interventions that I see sort of helping with sort of grappling with external stigma and just actually creating communities where we're not just sending um, historically excluded people to places where they will um, be subjected to uh, Lots yes. of harm. Yeah. Lots more. Yes, exactly. I think that's also a very valuable addition, the whole idea of not being only beneficiary, but also being part of the drawing board and being included from the very out onset of, of the process. Dunia, I see you nodding. Anything you want to share? Yes. No, just very short. I think I, I definitely agree with, with what you said, Nomfundo, because um, I, I don't think it's just the the fact that women need to get over the stigma because that's not it. It's just that the stigma needs to move away and needs to go away in terms of quota. So I think that is the way forward if we really want to still use this, this type of quota and, and women should not feel then in that case anymore that they just got hired because of their gender. And I think that that's, that's the solution, uh, I, I think. Yes. Uh, I think uh, we all agree on that. I see your colleagues nodding. And I think that's also very, uh, again, uh, important that the idea of getting over stigma, I, uh, I think we can all say we wish it was that easy, but, uh, but it is very much not. Eh? It's been a, a lifelong internalization process that you can just um, erase overnight. So uh, I think that's also very true. Um, maybe um, we can move on to, because I heard Nomfundo, um, unless someone still wants to add something yeah, on, on those conditions, good practices. Um, and if, if that's not the case, then um, I, I, um, I heard Nomfundo speaking about, obviously, the parallels between 
um, uh, subordinated positions of women, lower class, uh, black people, and so on. And I think what is very important here, and uh, Nosisiwe touched upon that briefly in the introduction as well, is, is the notion of intersectionality. Um, but before we delve into that, and I think that's that's uh, something important for us to delve into and not just to um, view it as something that is additional to the main discussion, I think it should be very much part of the core discussion. But um, maybe we can very briefly pause at uh, um, an instance. Um, it's a little bit in line with what Joachim has uh, introduced to us before, but there's this Dutch um, case of the Dutch equality body. I, I think you're all aware of that case, a Dutch case on affirmative action, which concerned the Technische Universiteit van Eindhoven, um, uh, which opened up a number of vacancies exclusively for women for a period of five years. Um, but the Dutch equality body found that system to be uh, discriminatory towards men um, and um, did not accept the policy. Um, if we look at the arguments, the body says that it was too absolute and too unconditional, which for me rings the bell to what um, Joachim said in, in, in his introduction. Um, it's very similar to the formal EU approach and that they said that there should have, that they should have looked at less restrictive measures um, um, so when we look at, at this case where like quota really uh, bump into the, the judiciary of, of, of or quasi judiciary system um, and it is then struck down because it is viewed as discriminatory towards men, um, what are your thoughts on that? Um, is there any way for a quota to pass a legal test or do the legal arguments have to change? Um, can we have a quick uh, short, uh, not short, sorry, I keep on saying short because I'm always stressed because of time, but just long and relaxed uh, round of thoughts on this one. I can start on this one and I think for me I'm coming from jurisdictions where I think that discussion earlier was really great because I think the professor talked about how um, European Union law starts from the assumption that preferential policies are an exception uh, to the equality rights and whereas in other jurisdictions we see sort of preferential policies as a necessary component uh, of equality and, and that has implicate sort of implications for how narrow uh, sort of we require the policies to be. And, and these are issues of uh, judicial review, like how far the courts are willing to go in questioning the choices that are made by administrators um, based on what it is that the equality right encompasses. So, I mean, so on the position of comparatively, if I were to apply South African law, this quota is not only an easy quota that would pass constitutional master, but it's even uh, less stringent than some of the things that we do a lot. For example, the quota required the woman to be equally qualified um, to be able to sort of, so again, in South Africa, we have what we call the suitable qualification criteria, which was discussed earlier. It, it's, it's one of those uh, strong preference forms of affirmative action. Um, so under that model already, this kind of quota would be quite, acceptable and, and ordinary in the South African context, but even more importantly, the level of judicial scrutiny, I think, for me, in this judgment, um, just showed the dangers and of having a model that still starts from the assumption that um, preferential policies are an exception to equality. Um, so one of the, the strange things that the court then says, because the institution had tried all these other interventions, but they weren't binding and it failed. This is evidence that this measure is not proportionate. And actually, in another context, you would think actually, the fact that they've tried this shows you that this was a last resort, like the coercive nature of uh, this intervention comes as a last resort because they've tried everything else. Um, so for me, it was very strange reading this, but understanding the position from which European law starts, um, make, it makes sense in this jurisdiction. Um, so I think what this judgment should be saying to European Union lawyers who are trying to push the boundaries um, of this is that they need to go back to the initial assumptions and push against those. That's where we have to start. Again, these judgments are from 15 years ago, 20 years ago. 
So there's a lot of room, I think, if new cases come to push that initial foundation. So that was my initial thought on this case. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a very, very, uh, uh, very, very true what you say. And I think it goes back to that distinction between formal and substantive equality. What is your framework? What is your basic view on equality from which then the arguments are then derived? Eh? And I think it's there's a risk to only focusing on arguments without really going back to what is the root vision on equality underlying these arguments, especially in legal cases. Um, I've now gotten a message that we do have only 20 minutes left, so I'm sorry if I'm giving very mixed signs on time, um, but if there's uh, anyone who wants to add to that, um, and, and if not, we'll move on, but any further talks? I, I will just make a, a small comment because um, I think after this intervention it will be, um, uh, um, well, useful. I haven't found myself in many places where I can say this, but this is one of the frustrations from an old feminist, because um, we didn't start out with this in, in the fight for gender equality. We didn't start out with this um, formal idea of equality. We started out with a substantive idea of equality, and it's actually the movement towards non-discrimination and equality law in, in my view, uh, and it's probably a political view that has that is now forcing us to try to put substantive policies in a framework that doesn't fit. And it is really frustrating sometimes. And I'm sometimes a bit jealous of my colleagues from 40 years ago who could just say, well, we, we just need to emancipate women and this is the policies that we need. And nobody would ask, well, what are you doing for men? And are they entitled to these policies as well? And now, I mean, I have regular discussions with Joachim on this point, but it makes it a lot harder that we now have to try to fit these policies that we know could work into this legal framework of equality and non-discrimination. Um, from the Belgian um, Institute, we followed this case very closely because um, the moment it was communicated, the policy of the of the university, we got questions from all Flemish universities. Can we do this too? So there was a lot of goodwill to at least find out, is this possible? And so we are very um, disappointed by the view of our colleagues of the of the equality body of the, the Netherlands. Um, and, and I don't know how you could, how we would legally construct this, but what I find absolutely necessary, if that is, if if more means are created, um, more positions, academic positions are created, especially with a view to remedying this gender inequality or other inequalities, then these rules about um, about positive or these limits on positive actions really should not be allowed to apply. Because we don't we don't only if we want to change these things we shouldn't only think as lawyers and as philosophers. But we should really also think as practitioners and policy makers. And and of course we have to understand the root vision of of equality concepts. But we also have to find ways with from the position where we are now to find policies to move us back towards this more uh, substantive idea of equality. So I think what you all share is that that frustration about the friction between wanting to push forward but do, having to do that within a system that is in many ways still founded on, on quite biased uh, premises. Um, I think if anything, if that can be uh, of comfort, I think it's also a sign that we're moving in the right direction. I think friction always comes with pushing boundaries, and um, but I know some days that really doesn't suffice. Um, but um, okay, if that uh, you would you yeah, like that? Like to, because I, I'm, I'm not, um, I'm not really convinced that we really need these these uh, vacancies uh, only for women. I think we, we still can do in academia at least. Eh? I think we can do still a lot of other things and a lot of, of positive actions that are allowed and that also um, these positive actions are not still uh, are not there yet. Eh? So so I think we can do we, we have still a lot of other possibilities um, and and might uh, um, well we, we have to work on these, uh, I think, uh, in the in the first place, um, I, I would say. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm also convinced that we we really have to, uh, um, yeah, for example, boot camps for women, introduction programs, trying to um, attract also um, more senior academic uh, women from all over the world to, to the KU Leuven. There's a lot of things we can do without this. Uh, 
uh, vacancies only for women or uh, so I so I would I would really go for the for the the other possibilities and and the other positive actions uh, to start with uh, already today eh? <laughs> um, uh, apart from the from the legal discussion that you all have and and uh, um, which I which I understand but but from a practical point of view I still think that we still can do a lot with just the positive actions that are allowed and, and can uh, be worked out uh, within the legal system as we have it today. Um, I, I just want to respond to that really quickly because I absolutely agree. And I know we've been talking a lot about quota now, but I would never say that quota are the most important element of a gender equality policy or any equality policy. Um, it's um, so we really need to do all these other things as well. I, I think this is also the frustration of a policymaker who is limited by constitutional courts and other uh, judiciary, uh, which is, I'm, I'm making a bit of a joke. Eh? I'm not really uh, proposing uh, to get away with the constitutional court, but uh, I mean, it is it is strange to see as a lawyer that that you take step forwards in the legal framework and at the same time they keep you back um, and and as a as a policymaker I think it would really once you have this ambition to create equality I really feel that a policymaker should have the means to do it uh, in a in a quick way and that of course that that doesn't mean that we should not do all the other things as well and we should do everything that we are legally allowed to do um. Um, thank you for those additions. I think um, um, I'm, I'm quite curious to hear what then to you are the more vital components of such a policy. And I think uh, Dunia and Fundo definitely will have some ideas on that too. Uh, but before moving on to that final uh, reflection on what else do we need then if not if quota are not uh, the most pivotal part of moving forward, um, is that notion of intersectionality. I really want us to pause uh, there and especially because we're running out of time. Um, um, so the idea of, of when we look at quota or other uh, AA, uh, affirmative action interventions uh, is that they're often focused uh, or even just general policies. Uh, if we look at the introduction, for instance, you see a separate gender action plan and a separate diversity policy as if women of color are not really women, right? I mean, that's 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 how I, 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 I often summarize it. Um, so um, that, that tendency of focusing on one identity marker, especially when it comes to gender, um, and therefore, those uh, quota or other uh, interventions do not reflect an intersectional approach of, uh, of, of oppressions that are formed because of the overlap or the uh, intersection of different identity markers. Um, so I would like to hear your thoughts uh, on that, um, uh, on how we can move to, uh, towards uh, policies that transcend that single axis model, that single axis uh, thinking. Um, or do we have ideas here? Do we know of good practices here? Um, is that also frustration that you encounter? I think, for instance, Dunia's research is very much on that intersection, for instance. So I think you 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 have um, interesting things to share there. But I'm I'm sure Amfundo has the same thing because you're looking at different systems that really uh, focus on different markers as a pivotal marker. So maybe we can start off with you both. Yes, uh, as you say, uh, Yusra. Um, the, the issue of, of um, intersectionality and the lack of intersectionality is not only with quota, but with the diversity policies and the gender policies uh, in general that we currently have in our academic institutions. And also in my research, I asked about women's attitudes towards these diversity policies. And what was a, a very relevant discussion amongst the women with an ethnic minority background was the fact that they did not feel um, taken up in these gender policies. And they pinpoint very explicitly uh, that these policies are still not equality policies, um, but that these focus on a particular type of women because they um, are really trying to solve and handle uh, issues that ethnic majority women are currently facing. So they, they do not recognize the, the barriers that they are experiencing uh, currently uh, to be tackled. And, and just to give you an example of the uh, the way the gender policies are currently uh, um, uh, constructed and implemented or like the, the perspective uh, that they use, uh, they, they usually start from that existing glass ceiling and the leaky pipeline that we are experiencing. And that was also uh, discussed uh, previously in the, in the presentation of the Kai um, uh, And so the fact that the more you move up in academia, the less women that you uh, will tend to see. 
And a lot of these gender policies are trying to focus on that crucial transition uh, to a postdoctoral and a tenure track uh, position. But if we look at women from an ethnic minority background, they do not even arrive to that point. They are um, having uh, a lot of issues in their uh, doctoral, um, uh, as, their, uh, as a doctoral student in the first place. Um, and, and that is also something that uh, Mirza, um, a UK academic, uh, shows in her research on, on black women, uh, that they tend to leave academia also because of the fact that they uh, feel invisible in these diversity policies, uh, which did not grant a safe and open space and did not grant any equal opportunities. So what we need in the first place is more inclusiveness in the definition of what a female academic is. Um, and that it, it is not a, a colorblind quota or colorblind affirmative action that we uh, currently have, and that we really try to make it intersectional. And, and now I was talking about uh, uh, gender and ethnicity, but another uh, um, uh, identity aspect that was uh, discussed um, a lot was being a mother in academia, um, that they have very different hurdles uh, compared to childless colleagues and other parents. And this is, again, a, a, another primary identity aspect that should be taken into consideration. And well, if I, if, if I look at uh, and give an example of um, research that looks at quota uh, used on a political level, uh, then it shows that countries who have like these uh, tandem quotas, so um, quotas that are nested uh, for gender and for ethnic minority groups, that they tend to increase the presence of women in these political seats. And if you have quota for gender and ethnicity separately, then we do not see an increase of ethnic minority women. So we really need to nest this and we really need to focus on the unique hurdles and, and uh, different experiences that they uh, have. And I was also uh, thinking about uh, um, uh, a good practice in, in uh, quota in academia, for example, related to uh, motherhood. Um, um, and I was thinking uh, here, for example, that a mother uh, will usually have uh, gaps in her CV uh, because she spent time with her family and um, what needs to be accounted for uh, when choosing the best candidates uh, between brackets um, uh, um, within that quota system is that um, it, it should be contextualized these gaps. It's not that she was less productive, but it was that she spent time with her family. And I think this is a small difference, but it can already make this quota system intersectional, um, I believe. Um, so yeah, these were, were just some uh, thoughts I had. Yeah. I also automatically think of, of disability or other uh, impairments. Yeah, I think it's very similar. Also, something that is often overlooked uh, as a, as an identity uh, marker or or um, acts on which oppression is is uh, sometimes materialized. And Amfundo, you want to add to what Dunia has shared? Yeah, I mean, I absolutely agree with everything she said. And I think one of the things is all of this comes from clearly defining what it is that the affirmative action measure is doing in a specific institution right, or in a specific jurisdiction. So in South Africa, we're grappling with the legacy of colonial and apartheid domination and oppression. We're grappling with racial, gendered, as well as a problem where there was historically exclusion of people with disabilities from the labor market, from general participation in community. So identifying sort of what it is that we're grappling with and what we're trying to achieve also helps us then in seeing who should be benefiting. Um, so the legislation in South Africa says, when we talk about the increase in representation of women, we disaggregate it. So we ask the question, how many disabled women, how many women who are black, how many black disabled women? So it goes that it's very granular for the purposes of ensuring that it is always intersectional. And I think you can legislate to design this, but for that to happen, you have to have clarity about what it is the policy is trying to achieve. And I think what Dunia was talking about now in the academic setting, the context is X, Y. So we're gonna be thinking about race, about gender, but we're also gonna be thinking about who bears a responsibility of childcare in a patriarchal society. So we're gonna be thinking about motherhood, which matters in that context, which matters in the context of the labor market. And I think having clarity in what the policy is doing allows us then to see who are the people who belong to multiple groups that we should be thinking about and when we're doing the work that Elizabeth was talking about of, of, of sort of checking whether or not there has been enforcement, whether there is progress, not just looking at have we increased the representation of women, but actually asking for the data and for the policies that are targeting 
black women that are targeting disabled women that are targeting or providing sort of um, support for women in academia who are also mothers um, or providing are we having system that enable all parents to have access to childcare in the workplace so those kinds of interventions come from having clarity on what it is that we are doing with a specific preferential policy and these are always contextual um yeah um, just uh, as, as a quick sub question there, just a uh, devil's advocate here, uh, but shouldn't intersectionality always be taken into account, even regardless of the goal of, of, of a contextual policy, isn't it both? Yeah, yeah. But, but, but what I'm talking about is that there are some sort of criteria. So for example, if we were going to talk about in South Africa, uh, having a broad policy that required disability status as well as economic disadvantage should be taken into account it doesn't fit our sort of purpose of redressing that specific historic disadvantage of racial and gender oppression under colonialism and apartheid so yes. contextually in south africa our concern is with these specific identity characteristics whereas in another jurisdiction economic yeah. disadvantage becomes a salient feature and characteristic that is much more important than salient yeah. in south africa class overlays on race so much that we don't actually grapple with class because it's not relevant for the specific historic yeah. injustice that we're grappling with so that's yeah. what i meant by contextualizing yeah. yeah that's i think that's that's very very clear and also very very uh, relevant um now, I think we are um, almost at the end of, of, of what we were granted in time here, but um, if uh, I would like to get your final thoughts on something that has been coming up quite uh, regularly throughout the conversation and very rightly so, which is that focus on we need much more than only quota, uh, quota should not be the, the, the the focus of our attention or not the sole focus of our attention. I think it would be nice for everyone who's attending here and uh, to have that um, um, perspective on what else do we need? What is the way forward? Um, maybe we can just uh, gather like two minutes of your thoughts, each of you to, to round things up and to have that um, more broader perspective on what else do we need uh, for Quora to work? Um, what is the bigger puzzle um, of which this is only a piece? Maybe I shall start. Um, so I would take all of the, the five uh, elements of the gender policy plan of the KU Leuven. I think uh, we need all, all those um, um, actions uh, or strategic uh, aims. Um, I would also include a, pol um, a policy on uh, violence and sexual harassment, a firm policy on violence and sexual harassment, but I, because I think it's a... a um, up till now, unclear how much it limits uh, women in the development of, amongst others, an academic career. I think it's really underestimated. Uh, um, in, in general, in the Institute, we would say um, that you really need to have a holistic approach to all elements of inequality. Um, between women and men to 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 really have uh, the effect that you're aiming for, and then um, I I would just like to add that I uh, it's crucial also to have these uh, in this um, uh, th we have concepts of intersectionality, but we now need to translate that to policies, and I really like this idea of nested quota, um, and. I will just abuse my time here a little bit to ask uh, uh, Dunia and Nomfunda if they could um, maybe in their answer also say something about um, how we would make quota, how, how, what percentage, how do we have to um, um, uh, decide what percentage that we should need for these for these nest, uh, nested quota. And just one final remark: it's what Nomfunda also already uh, mentioned. These part participative procedures are extremely important, and I, I have to admit, uh, uh, even at the uh, institute, we fall short of really having um, participative procedures in drawing up our policies and that's one of the things that we absolutely want to improve on in the coming years yeah okay i think you're real point i think dunia and anumfundo will be happy to share just to point out it's Nomfundo, uh, i think um and it's just because we're in this space i feel comfortable enough to point that out because um 
precisely because we are in this space. Um, so um, um, yes, thank you very much, Lisbeth. Um, um, Deb, would you want to uh, share your reflections on, because you've also stressed that from the very beginning of the conversation eh, that you you don't, you're not a big, uh, I mean, you're not, you, you want to focus on other parts of the policy. So feel free to share your thoughts. We're curious to hear them. Well, I, I would add a couple, a couple of things. I think, I think training in implicit bias is, is a very important one. And I think we should work on that and, and it's permanent and persistent. So we, we really have to have to work on that further on, further on that. Um, I also think it's important to monitor what is going on. And, and to uh, especially also with regard to the intersectionality, I think we have still uh, a lot of work to do there also at KU Leuven eh, because it's not, not always easy, the registration of the combination of different diversity characteristics and how we will do that. We do that for students, but we don't do it for our staff at the moment and we don't follow it up. So, so we, we are trying to, um, to, um, to look into that uh, as well. Um, and I think that one, one way um, or one, one route uh, for, for uh, future action um, might also be to, um, to try to um, introduce a more holistic approach in assessing uh, researchers in general eh, in, in academia. Um, so, um, and, and uh, making sure that we have room for what I would call non-classical career paths. So that that involves like all, um, so that we we give room in the in the files and in the application procedure to to uh, to explain your own personal his or her story. Eh? So the so the um, and the personal circumstances uh, and so that they are taken into in, into account when we evaluate and reward um, um, uh, professors, for example, eh, uh, or for their promotion process. Um, uh, so we have introduced the bio sketch there in order to have this more holistic approach and to um, to give them room to explain what their um, bio their sketch. Step. Can you elaborate bio this sketch. bio sketch? Yes, it's a it's a, well it's a it's a brief summary on two pages where they have to explain their their most important realizations from their point of view and where they also can explain what the essential personal choices they have made during their career, why they have made them, and so on. So it's it's a, it's I would say it's giving more contextual information on the more ob objective data that are often in a file when, when researchers are assessed, and in such a way that you can take into account the personal circumstances. And of course, there is also room to to, um, to explain that you had a couple of months off for whatever reason, or that you had some experience in industry, or you had some. So, so in order to um, to um, to make uh, the the committees uh, to um, to stress that um, yeah you you really have to to pick out a few uh, positive aspects of a of a career and of a file and and work with that in order to give the 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 objective data more more circumstance more context and that's really very helpful for our committees to to look in another way to to when they assess uh, researchers uh, to. Uh, yeah. The, and, and I think it might be an answer as well to this uh, intersectionality discussion, because it's not only for gender, but it's also for uh, a lot of the other diversity characteristics, very important to not focus too much on this on this classical uh, career paths and to give room to explain personal choices in general. So that might be one good practice that I think might be helpful to further think on <laughs> I think that's a very, for the future yes yeah but i think it's a very valuable point again eh? because if there's one concern that i had when listening to the conversation tonight is also that we tend to still focus on how to take into account gaps when looking at promotion criteria which focus on output and publication mm -hmm. but that is also part of the problem uh, i mean at least um you can see that as part of a problem that the, the way we look at what academia means and the way we promote people and and the uh, increasing uh, neoliberal logics of, of what an academic should do and i think that that we can, you cannot really leave that out of the equation um so i think that's a very valuable point um dunya and nomfundo um would um who if you would like to take the floor for the final thought and then the and then you can just follow after your colleague Shall I go? Yes, okay. Um, maybe to uh, first answer on uh, uh, Lisbeth's um, 
I cannot give you a, a specific percentage of uh, uh, how you uh, need to create these nested quotas, but I think that in order to decide on this percentage, we need to first of all look at who is in the minority and who is not included. And I would look at, uh, um, amongst others, uh, ethnicity or race, um, look at class, uh, sexual orientation and family status. I think these are one of the four primary uh, identity uh, aspects that we really need to include in this uh, um, quota system. Um, and we can also look at, for example, um, um, the inflow uh, of uh, uh, doctoral students that we currently have with how many they are uh, based on their um, uh, class background, based on their uh, ethnic minority background and decide upon that, um, how uh, much we need to include them in, in this quota and divide them based on that. Uh. Um, and, and just uh, um, one of my uh, final thoughts uh, um, of, of what we need more than, than a quota, um, I think a quota is, is definitely one of, of the first and, and maybe easier steps to include um, in uh, our academic institutions uh, to increase the presence of, of women. Um, but the issue is not only yet that, that women uh, do not get an equal um, uh, uh, chance uh, to get the position and equal access, but that it often also, um, that a lot happens on the day-to-day -day work environment. Um, that it is there where they uh, really experience different forms of harassment, uh, as Lisbeth says, this is definitely something that needs to be uh, paid attention to more, uh, but also to exploitation uh, within this neoliberal logic that academia has taken on um, and the discrimination. And this can be explicit or subtle. And just to give you one example of, of uh, what I uh, um, uh, found a, a typical form of, of um, everyday uh, sexism and gendered racism was, uh, for example, patronization, uh, that these women's presence and work was undervalued, so that they were often forgotten to be included in relevant projects, to be included in relevant networks, uh, network meetings, and so on. Uh, but also, and that's where intersectionality again comes in, ethnic minority women face this kind of patronization very differently. Uh, they, for example, experienced how uh, they were considered to be less objective, um, or uh, especially in the humanities and the social sciences, that they can only conduct research on uh, um, themes that are related to their identity. Yeah? So on migration, on ethnic relations, on racism, but everything else should not be touched. Um, and so again, this is something that shows how important it is to include this intersectionality when looking at their experiences. Uh, but also a micromanagement was something that occurred very much, um, especially amongst ethnic minority women a micromanagement of their behavior, of their appearances, of the way they dress. Uh, uh, for example, if they dress modestly, why do you wear the things you wear? Uh, this was something that was very common. Um, and um, the micromanagement in terms of their work, uh, where um, um, we saw how um, supervisors um, have this oriental expectation that they are submissive and obedient, um, and therefore think that they will do the work that's just the way it is supposed to and expected to um, at least. So um, what, what these uh, kinds of, of, of uh, harassment and, and exploitation and, and discrimination shows is that we can not only achieve um, um, an equal academia if uh, we're going to use quota, uh, we really need a cultural transformation. Uh, we need to pay attention to the work culture and the work climate and that is currently not inclusive to everyone. And that is what needs to, I think, change. And we need therefore a very systemic effort. Uh, and it will of course uh, take time, um, but this is something that needs to be um, taken up and uh, uh, needs to uh, be focused on uh, right now, I think. Thank you, Dunia. A very, um, very, very uh, valuable uh, additions as well. Um, to add in a personal, uh, something that I personally recognize again, uh, again during those years, um, um, on co in conferences, uh, I would get the question, ah, but how, can you really be neutral? Are you quite, uh, whereas other white male colleagues uh, researching the exact same topic would, would never get that question. So very, very valid points. Namfundo, um, I, I give you the floor to round things up for us. Yeah, my roundup is actually just to respond to something Lisbeth talked about, and I think is important um, to just give the, the comparative uh, sort of cap, like risk uh, with the 30% the minimum. So that comes from all of that research and critical mass and what it is and 33%. Um, the dangers of that is they're creating what then becomes a ceiling for women. So you have then again, the courts coming in and entrenching this into law. Um, so we have it in India. So now there's a 50% ceiling 
uh, for uh, reservations, which was a construction by, by, by the sort of the Indian Supreme Court. Um, in South Africa, a similar sort of movement in sort of a lot of the jurisprudence in creating a, a sort of a ceiling based on these numerical targets. So one way to try to get to get out of that is to peg the number on demographics, but also to make it flexible, right? So that you don't have an instance where an employer actually is targeting women uh, for several reasons and then has an overrepresentation of women um, in relation to the population and is found to be foul of equality provisions. Again, the court's coming in and saying, you're breaching sort of the right to equality because now you have more than 30% women um, on your staff. Um, so this is just something that we, when we are crafting these policies, we have to be careful with because courts then turn these against um, the initial sort of reason why we're introducing them. So from a policy perspective, it's one of the things I always say is like, make sure that it doesn't become the ceiling um, because then that it becomes a reservation. So the 70% is then left for men because um, that is what ends up happening, saying we've met the 30%, now everything else is for the men, right? Um, so that's what I wanted to say in relation to that. Um, but I agree with everything Dunia said. I think changing the culture and norms of academic work, um, of academic expectations in relation to who have we designed the model that getting senior professorships requires you to be this much publication to have been recognized. Some universities have, you are selected by your community, like the peer professorships. Now, if they are predominantly male and they, they have 50 publications, they will look for themselves. I mean, there's research that shows that this is actually what happens. Um, so just changing those sort of dominant norms about what it is that makes an academic is important. But more broadly, I think this is something that I came to towards the end of my research as I'm wrapping up. It's always keeping in mind that affirmative action is a very blunt instrument from the problem that we're actually trying to redress. We're grappling with deeply entrenched patriarchy, white supremacy, ableism, uh, class disadvantage. Um, uh, we're grappling with homophobia in society. These are really, really blunt instruments, so we should always be pushing them to the extremes because our actual problem is bigger. Because I think sometimes when we just focus on the sharpness of quotas, and I think that's what happened in the Dutch case is like, it was, it just felt so sharp. We forget to locate it within the broader context within which this was an institution that was performing the worst in Europe in relation to the representation of women in the sciences. So by placing it out of that context, we lose the broader picture. We lose the broader frame in which women have in this context, been historically marginalized from uh, being able to make it in the sciences. Um, so we should really push these, knowing that they are really blunt to the fullest that we can, because our problem is way bigger than what we could ever be able to achieve with these instruments. I think that's, uh, uh, we couldn't have wished for a better conclusion. Uh, I think uh, let's not be deceived by what seems sharp and let's keep in, keep in focus that bigger context and think of ways that different domains in society can keep uh, in focus that bigger and more complex context. Um, we have three questions. Um, I'm gonna try my best because they're quite long. Um, so forgive me, but I'm gonna just have to read them out loud um, and then we can see what we, get out of them. Um, first question um, of Antoine de Spiegeler is uh, if are affirmative actions for different minorities, for example, gender and race quotas or race and disability quotas compatible with one another? If yes, does the overall increase negative effect on the dominant category of applicants come into the assessment? Um, and if no, then are there criteria to decide which minority should receive prioritized protection through affirmative action? Um, I think it's very clear that very much ties into the intersectionality discussion. I think we've actually touched upon most of that, but if someone um, wants to give a short reply to that, um, summarizing what was already uh, said there, then, then we can um, close that question. Anyone who feels to to clarify that how that it's not a question of, of um, competition of oppressions or, or or that those different interventions are compatible? Anyone? 
I, I, yeah, I guess I, I what you just said right now, I mean, one is, uh, again, back to, to the issue that we talked about, the context issues. Like, again, a lot of the time when people talk about intersectionality, they do this aggregation of like, this identity, this identity adds up and then it accumulates and then this should be the preferred candidate. But actually in asking the question, what is it that affirmative action is doing in our context? We're able to identify the identity characteristics that we are targeting, that we are grappling with. If we're grappling with specific um, legacy of Hindu caste hierarchy, then we are targeting the lower castes. We understand how sort of patriarchy sort of also operates in that. So, so, we, so we understand the identity characteristics that are important to us and that we use in designing policies in our context based on the specific forms of disadvantage that we are trying to address through the specific policy. I mean, India recently extended its um, affirmative action regime specifically target um, the third gender, which India is one of the jurisdictions that recognizes a third gender. Uh, and, and the reason they did that is because they it recognized specific systemic discrimination disadvantage that is faced by this group in Indian society and I think that's where we should start from in identifying what it is we're trying to address. Okay I think that's a that, that's that, that's a perfect answer and I think that summarizes everything that has been said and actually it's a perfect window into the second question um, which touches upon how does KU live and in particular but I think it's a more general question which to approach people who do not define as men or women so very much that non-binary gender fluidity that Nomfundo literally just touched upon um, so any thoughts on that I think that's also a very important point um, anyone wish to share their thoughts? Maybe Elisabeth, I'm sure that you, the, the Institute is, 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 is grappling with that one. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, I was wondering whether I should take the floor or not. Um, you don't have maybe to. I should start with uh, saying that I've just been asked to preside a working group of the Diversity Council that will especially be um, thinking about uh, sexual orientation and uh, gender identity and um, gender expression. So uh, we will uh, be, be uh, thinking about what recommendations we could uh, suggest to the Diversity Council and the university uh, as a whole to, to grapple with, uh, amongst other things, uh, this issue. Um, the Institute for the Equality of Women and Men is also competent to treat questions on discrimination on the basis of um, gender identity, gender expression. Um, uh, it's, it's called sexual characteristics. Um, and um, what is still called in the legislation uh, sex uh, change, which is not a good uh, term. But um, so um, it's for me, it's clear that all these um, uh, fundamental questions touch upon the idea of what it is to be a woman and what it is to be a man. And that is, it, it ties in with, with what we've been saying, that we should really always have our vision, our idea of equality uh, should be, be clear. Um, and it, it's, I've noticed that it's, it proves very uh, fruitful to think about gender identity and gender expression, also to think about what what do, do we expect of women? What do we expect of men? And why does that sometimes differ? And how can we change um, those ideas and make a more make more room for um, everyone, regardless of your sex or your gender or your gender expression? Um, of course, there are specific issues like like um, uh, this creation of a, of a third uh, legal recognition of, of um, uh, the gender identity uh, or a non-binary non -binary gender identity um, or a gender fluid identity, uh, but we're only at the start of that uh, work, uh, basically. Um, I'm sure many of you know that the, Const the Belgian Constitutional Court has um, uh, order ruled that the, the the fact that there's only two options, uh, being female or being male, legally, um, is a discrimination towards uh, non-binary and gender-fluid uh, people. So, 
Belgium will have to adapt its legislation, but it does um, it does give rise to many questions because we see there is a lot of discrimination and even violence against uh, transgender um, uh, people and non-binary non people or be people with a with a more variety in their gender expression. Um, and so we really want to make sure that this creation of a third gender or legal recognition of a third gender identity does not make it even more easy to uh, discriminate um, people. Um, so, the, but it's it's um, it's definitely um, it's definitely a very important uh, question that brings us to to fundamental issues that have an impact on gender equality as a concept as well. Absolutely, um, I would I would uh, ask uh, your colleagues to sh to add their thoughts, but I think we're we're gonna have to move on if that's okay by everyone to the final uh, question, which is. Uh, what would be the most suited introduction for quota in academia today and in the future by the legislator or at company or university level, knowing that decision makers at university level are still majoritarily white male? Um, anyone? Um, maybe just very short. Uh, um, it is definitely true that um, at the uh, university level, the most like the, the key decision makers are still white men um, and well it, it is not only related to uh, their, their uh, uh, identity but we also see and that is also based on research especially in the UK then that um, decision makers are often the one who um, are against change uh, have a problem with change uh, may it be with uh, regards to gender and diversity policies or with other forms of change within the institution and I think that if we really want to uh, push this forward, if we really want to push uh, quota uh, into our institutions, it might be um, necessary, uh, maybe for a short amount, uh, amount of time, maybe for a long amount of, amount of time, to um, have this first on a national level and um, to, to push institutions to really include these quota, whether they like it or not. Um, and, and I think sometimes this push is necessary to then um, um, understand why this quota is uh, needed um, and to uh, finally just accept this and see this as a regular form of, of, uh, of, of measures that they need to include in their policy. And so sometimes it is needed to, to uh, give that a little push to uh, institutions and definitely within academic organizations that are still very um, uh, difficult and opposed to uh, change in general. Um. Excellent. I think one final question that was actually asked by one of the organizers um, and that we didn't really touch upon directly, but as a really final closing thought was um, given the whole connectedness of uh, academic staff with students and with uh, the whole pre-academic um, career uh, was a question regarding students. Uh, if affirmative action regarding students is any is at all a part of the equation or do you see uh, other pathways there? Um, we can really suffice with a very short uh, rebuttal here, but I think that would be nice uh, for us to close up with the thought on what about students? How do they tie in with that bigger discussion on staff? I can do the really short answer, yes. <laughs> Wonderful. Someone who has a little longer short answer <laughs> and then we can round up. <laughs> I think so my research is thinking about what it means to decolonize legal education specifically. It, it doesn't just require us to change the composition of who is teaching, what is being taught, but also who are the students in the classroom. So outside of the context of affirmative action, when we're trying to sort of move away from the neoliberal frame of legal education specifically, and trying to decolonize it, it has to do with who's in the classroom, who is teaching, and what is being taught. And I think when you think about all of those together, um, yeah, we should be concerned with, are we attracting predominantly white male upper class students um, into legal fraternity? And the answer is, even in a country like South Africa, we still are. 
I think uh, the same can be said for us, and I think uh, that's 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 a great and and a way to uh, end things. There's still a lot of work to be done, but I think I'm not the only one to say that it's been quite an insightful evening, uh, very complimentary speakers. Um, but I give the word now to Marie um, to give thanks to everyone. Uh, to give thanks, wow, that sounded very formal. <laughs> um, but <laughs> to thank everyone, <laughs> um, um, and so yes, thank you very much. Um, uh, so we just really wanted to, to thank everyone who's uh, spoken tonight. Um, definitely Yusra as well. Thank you also for being very patient with us because you have been juggling our instructions and moderating the panel and you have done a very good job. I think everyone agrees. Um, so thank you very much. And also thank you to our other speakers. Um, I think everyone's learned a lot tonight and I think it was a very thought provoking uh, evening, um, and I think this is, this is illustrated by the fact that a large number of our audience is still with us, even though we've, we've gone over time, let's say, a little bit. Um, they are right, of course, because it, it was very interesting. Um, and I think I, I would also like to really thank you for the, um, the tone of the debate, because it was really nice to see everyone being very constructive and, and respectful of each other. And we don't always see this in panel sessions or discussions, so this was very nice as well. Um, I would also say to the speakers that we have a small token of our appreciation, uh, which you will receive via email <laughs> over the next couple of days. Um, so again, I'd like to say thank you very much uh, from everyone present here and especially from Undivided and Lean and Live Law. And I will do something which may not be very characteristic, um, but I will give the last word to a colleague of ours um, from uh, Uhent and U U Antwerp, I think, um, who thinks there might be academics here who are interested in affirmative action and who has a call for papers um, that they would like to launch. So I'm going to give the floor um, to Matthias. And again, thank you to everyone. Hey, yeah, thank you for um, thank you for the presentation and sorry for taking up your time. I'm going to be really, really um, short. One, thank you. Um, these arguments were just one after the other, I was just, yes, yes, yes. I wish this was mainstream thinking. Unfortunately, um, I don't think it is yet. Um, also the old feminist argument, here I am as a young queer scholar, literally saying the basic same thing. So this is still alive. Um, and I'm, I'm very happy that we, can, um, that we can just say these things and that we can keep pushing until we get there. And then also these arguments, what all of you have been saying basically is exactly what I'm looking for on paper um, for a call of paper that I'm, cur I'm currently editing a special issue for Ethique et Maatschappij. Unfortunately, it's only in Dutch, um, but it is, uh, we're doing a special issue on affirmative action and precisely the desirability or undesirability of equal treatment. Um, and what is the role of the law in actually correcting uh, power dynamics and how we can achieve this. So I'll just drop the link in the chat right now. And if any of you is interested in contributing or, or just writing some of the thoughts that you had tonight on paper, that would be really appreciated and um, just useful. So let's spread the word. Um, thank you for this five minutes of your time and I'll, I'll drop it right now in the link. And thanks again for saying everything that you said. Oh, and also as a queer scholar, just saying gender, gender is not binary. And I've, I've heard a lot of gender women, gender woman, gender woman, but there's trans people, binary and non-binary, binary, and um, yeah, I just wanted to have that said out there. So thanks. So I, I think, thank you, Matthias, for um, the contributions there. Uh, and then I think all we do, that remains for us to do is to wish everyone a very lovely evening. And thank you again for attending um, and participating tonight.